you cannot deliver high quality care for all of your population now and for future generations unless you tackle climate change. The NHS cannot adapt to the full scale of climate change. Just last year during the heat wave in the United Kingdom, we saw intensive care units having to shut down, operating suites unable to cope with the heat, roads starting to melt. Those health impacts of climate change, they are astronomical. They are, let's be serious, genuinely terrifying. But the world has a choice. The United Kingdom has a choice. The NHS has a choice. The way clinicians are trained is to deal with the individual that's in front of them, to look at their symptoms, to try to treat them. And that individual-based approach has helped us to treat many people. But we're at a point where we need to step away from that model and to look at a more global picture. For the Caribbean, 2014 to 2018, over 761,000 children were displaced because of extreme weather events. Healthcare as a sector contributes 5.2% to global greenhouse gas emissions. If healthcare sector was a country, we would be fifth on the list of emitters, fifth. We have to understand that we have one blue planet, one small marble. The systems that make the planet healthy and viable are all connected and connects each of us. So greenhouse gas emissions in a high-income country affects the health of children in a low-income country. I think healthcare professionals have a duty not just to the patient in front of them, but also the impacts of the treatments they choose. That's always been the case for healthcare systems with a limited financial budget in order for there to be equity amongst patients. I think the same is true of the carbon budget. We can't go on just ignoring the carbon footprint of the care that we provide. That has to be a factor in the way we plan and structure health services. Climate change and respiratory health are really closely linked. I mean, so much of respiratory health is down to the quality of the air that we breathe. And there are loads of links between the climate crisis and air quality. Patients with asthma are definitely more aware of the quality of the air they breathe, of the changes in temperature, more aware of the pollen seasons. They can tell if there's been a wildfire before anyone else because they can feel it in the way they're breathing. I mean, historically, we definitely haven't really thought about the climate impact when choosing inhalers, which we need to. If we're going to reach net zero healthcare, we need to. The propellants in spray inhalers account for approximately 13% of the NHS carbon footprint related to the delivery of care. Powerful greenhouse gases, 1,500 to 3,000 times more powerful than carbon dioxide. So a small inhaler can actually have a very big carbon footprint equivalent to 10, 30, maybe even 40 kilos of carbon dioxide equivalent in one inhaler. The big reliance on the blue spray inhalers has become a bit of a habit, but it's not a good way of managing asthma. About a third of patients with asthma are just using the reliever inhalers. And actually what they need is some controller medication to get the disease itself under control. One patient who I came across recently had three different spray inhalers. Now, we knew we could get the medicine into his airways better with a different inhaler, so we switched him to a dry powder inhaler, which he was able to use with good technique, which gave him better mastery of his breathlessness and seeing him in clinic a year later and it came out over a ton of carbon dioxide off the carbon footprint of his treatment from one year to the next. That's hugely rewarding as a clinician. Small island developing states contributes less than one percent to greenhouse gas emissions. That's the social injustice of the situation. One of the challenges we don't see the consequences immediately of, of our actions. It's very difficult to have that global perspective on the things that you do, but we need to develop that mindset if we are to meet the challenge of the climate crisis. Sea level rise is a big part of that story. Tuvalu is an island in the Pacific. The people from Tuvalu feel that they will not have somewhere to live, an island to live on within the next 30 years. Just from our inhalers alone, just from the last two years, 
we've been able to reduce the NHS's emissions by the size of the entire country of Vanuatu, one of the most vulnerable countries in the world. The climate crisis is a global health crisis. We have a responsibility to tackle it for the sake of our patients in the United Kingdom, but for the sake of the public everywhere in the world. Every individual, every country has a responsibility to run at this problem. Countries that have bigger emissions, countries that have had bigger emissions for longer, have a bigger responsibility to run at this problem. We've been very clear. Within the decade, the NHS will not purchase from anyone that does not meet or exceed our own ambitions, our own commitments on net zero. That's pretty damn ambitious. I'm Simon Evans. I'm the executive lead for sustainability. We have a sustainability checklist completed as part of any single business case that comes into the organisation. For everything we want to do, we are considering the impact. I don't think it is any longer that subject that people want to avoid. I think it's one that people are prepared to embrace and recognise we need to do things differently. We anaesthetists have a huge carbon footprint. 500 kilos per day as compared to Joe Blog with 25 kilos per day. So that's huge. With a newer agent called Desflurane, we found that it is the worst climate polluter in terms of global warming potential. Through training and procedural changes, the Trust started to reduce its use of Desflurane. We did it piecemeal initially. Having that shift from your regular clinical practice to something you have to do for the environment was quite difficult. Lastly, we involved our executive teams. I went up, did a presentation and said we have to stop buying this agent. And with the help of pharmacy and the divisional team decision, we decided to stop procuring Desflurane from last year. Desflurane use will be restricted in the EU from 2026. Not that we are bringing our patients to any harm because there are other alternative, slightly better inhalational anaesthetic agents. And if you just zoom out into the bigger picture, what is climate change doing for the patients? You know, it's increasing pollution, it's increasing respiratory diseases, preventable deaths due to hyperthermia. So if you combine all of that, it is still patient-centric. Walking aids is traditionally a single-use item. You know, for these kind of items to be single-use, it's actually quite shocking. For this to end up in landfill, it's not acceptable. So it's our duty to actually make sure that they're reused. I wasn't born here in the UK. I came from a developing country, the Philippines. And there, it's about repairing and reusing rather than discarding. By doing that, year on year, we will be saving money which helps, of course, fund more of the clinical side of things and at the same time, reduce the carbon footprint of the trust. And it's good for the patient and the community. This is the Royal Wolverhampton Solar Farm. It is 31 acres. This is part of the energy resiliency plan that the trust has. It plays a vital part of our estate's decarbonization will then allow us to move forward with installing our heat pumps and also providing support to the EV infrastructure that we will be installing on site at New Cross. For us, the way forward is really on-site generation and it does allow us then to have a semblance of control in terms of our electricity costs, in terms of resiliency, and also in terms of how we actually use our energy, it is an opportunity that we should all be exploiting. Did I ever expect to do this 10 years ago? No. Five years ago, conversations were taking place though, so the world has moved at a pace. Be open-minded, be ambitious, demonstrate the commitment at a senior level though, and put some good planning behind it so you can actually deliver some meaningful change. The first time I was here, it was just starting and it was just dirt. And now you have all of these panels in here. I am so proud. It's something to celebrate. And I'm actually happy to be able to come here and, and say, yes, this is it. Yeah. <laughs> One third of NHS trusts are currently building solar across their roof space. The transformation we are seeing is astronomical. It is game changing. 
Why would you do that? You do that because it cleans up the air around your hospital and you care about the 36,000 deaths from air pollution every year if you are a high quality healthcare system. You would do it because it directly tackles climate change. And let me tell you, you would do it because it saves money. How much money does it save? It depends on the size of the trust. It depends on the size of your solar field. But for some of the best examples we've seen across the country, millions. It saves millions of pounds that you can reinvest back into your community, back into patient care. duty of healthcare to be involved in this. I think it is political and there's a sense of injustice that has really come through from a lot of the younger people wondering why they're inheriting the mess that has been created by the generation of people in the highly developed countries who are still consuming huge amounts unnecessarily. The choices we all make have a carbon cost and a health cost. When moving to net zero emissions, we have to focus our use of limited resources in ways that really improve our health and well-being, maintaining an environment that can be healthy for everyone. Healthcare is about 5, 5.5% of global total emissions, it's roughly the same size as aviation and shipping combined. If you can go one step further and start to make the case that actually a low carbon future is a healthier future, cleaner air, healthier diets, more livable, greener cities, the kind of place we want to go to if the health profession can make that argument, I think that's where you move from 5% to the entirety of the world's emissions. The GMC says that it is our duty to protect the public in emergencies and climate change is a health emergency. So we've got to think about the bigger picture. Some small islands have tried to make it into global courts, but the wheels of justice, I think, move slowly. And in the meantime, we're having hurricanes, we're having extreme heat, we're having sea level rise, we're having ocean acidification. We want a health analogy. We're addicted to fossil fuels. 91% of the NHS's 1.4 million healthcare professionals want to tackle climate change. They want to work for an organization that lives up to their own values. The prescription is pretty simple. Head towards a healthier future. Head as fast as you can, head as urgently as you can. Treat this like it is a health emergency. People are suffering now, people's health is suffering now, people are dying because of the effects of climate chaos. Communities now are suffering, communities in the future are going to suffer more. And it's our job as health professionals to put prevention into work. We are very fortunate to be alive now, to have the opportunity to do something about it. And as health professionals, we have an amazing opportunity. We need to use our professional voice as doctors, nurses, occupational therapists, physiotherapists to say what the impact is on our patients now and what it will be in the future. We need to use our voice for the future of our patients, of our communities and of the planet. There are 1.4 million healthcare professionals in this country, 1.4 million of us. And if we take 1.4 million actions, I don't care what they are, they can be something that you do personally. They can be something that changes the way that you practice medicine. They can be how you engage with the public, how you engage with politics. Any one of those actions, it's all about what we do at 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. It's not about 2040, it's not about 2050. It's about that 9 a.m. tomorrow morning question. What are you gonna do? In this, our 200th year, we draw attention to climate change as a critical health issue. To drive progress, we have two asks. 